Uh, my name is Shannon Culver, and this is Sabina. Uh, Sabina is the Public Services Librarian at the National Network for Equitable Library Services, Service, singular, um, often referred to by the acronym NELS. Uh, NELS is a national digital library of accessible format materials that works with public libraries and publishers across Canada to ensure equal access to reading materials for all Canadians. She works with public libraries to help local readers find technology and books they want to read in whatever format works for them. Her favorite discussion topics are the commercial availability exception in the Copyright Act and the privatization of public library spaces. Sabina lives in rural Alberta where she doesn't entirely belong, uh, this is according to her, and loves talking with people about books and revolutions of all sizes. And I'm Shannon Culver, I'm the manager of technology at eBound Canada, a nonprofit organization that enables Canadian independent publishers to participate in the digital economy. Uh, I've also taught the digital publishing and production course at uh, Ryerson University in the Chang School of Continuing Education. And prior to my work at eBound, I was the manager of publisher operations at Kobo. Okay. <laughs> so this is the hazard of uh, not testing your computer before, and so now we don't have our speaker's notes, so you'll see us going back and forth like, whose slide is this? So apologies in advance, and apologies for all the things we miss and get wrong. Um, <laughs> neither of us is an ebook developer, neither of us, is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. So both of us are here as sort of um, people who are interested in this topic and interested in furthering it. And I guess in the spirit of Dave Kramer's sort of uh, punk rock approach, we're sort of like bicycle mechanics rather than ebook developers, right? Yeah, I like yeah. that analogy. Okay. <laughs> um, you wanna talk about eBound? Yeah, so eBound uh, was initially a project that was started by the Association of Canadian Publishers sort of in the early days of eBooks when they realized that um, it was gonna be a lot of work for Canadian publishing houses, particularly the small ones, to uh, make ebooks and figure out who they should be working with in that market um, in terms of selling ebooks and getting them into libraries. And so they decided to sort of form a, um, it was initially a, I think it was called the Canadian Digital Service Project. And um, so it was a way to sort of mobilize all of these independent Canadian publishers to um, use, to sort of find shared resources and to move everybody into this new part of the uh, industry. And a few years later when they realized that eBooks weren't going anywhere, um, the Canadian Digital Service Project was sort of rolled out into its own organization, which is now eBound Canada, although we still have a really close relationship with uh, the Association of Canadian Publishers. Um, we still share an office with them, so physically and uh, our work is very close. Um, and so we do a lot of different things. We work with vendors on behalf of our clients. We help our clients find uh, companies that can make ebooks for them, or, or we advise them on making their own ebooks. And we do a lot of research and professional development as well in sort of new areas of the industry. So, uh, as Shannon explained in my introduction, which uh, I should have updated when Lauren offered me the opportunity to do so. Um, so NELS is an alternate format producer. So we work, we're funded by eight provinces and territories to produce books in accessible formats for people with print disabilities. So we produce those books and we distribute those books through public libraries. So the idea is that anyone in Canada with a print disability can access books in whatever format through their public library, and if they're a funding province, they can also request books. So we, we take requests from readers and we produce them. So we produce e-text, which is basically a Word document. We produce daisy books, which are a fully accessible uh, digital format. So that the way we explain it to libraries is, you know those CD audiobooks you have that have 20 discs? Well, the cool thing about a daisy is it fits on a single CD and they get it. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's sort of the, the gist that libraries catch on to. So the other formats we produce are recorded MP3, so people who just want to listen to an audiobook. And we also produce EPUB3 with media overlays. So the, why, why are we, why, are, why am I here? Um, so the, uh, 
two months into her new job, our content coordinator, Farah Little, who's back there, who's super rad. Um, maybe you put your hand up so you're not just smiling at me. Sorry, Farah. <laughs> so she's neat and worth talking to if you're interested in this, which is why I made her put up her hand. Two months into her job, she started researching this new format that was called DAISY 4, which is the latest DAISY format, and she found out that it was basically EPUB. It was EPUB. The other thing that was happening was we were starting to produce, like, we learned about this EPUB 3 with media overlays, and Farah started producing this as a format for our readers. And of course, none of our users, most of whom are seniors in rural communities, know how to use this format, but produce it, we, we do. So one of the things we do is we take EPUB files, we convert them to Word documents, we edit them, and then we create an EPUB out of that. So we're going EPUB, Word document, EPUB, which makes no sense. So we realized early on that why are, like, why are we doing this when the EPUB can be accessible from the start? We wouldn't need to do the, the crazy stuff in the middle. So that's how we sort of got interested in, in accessible formats. And we've been to eBookCraft a couple of times, and we learn stuff here every time, but we are, at heart, public librarians. So we're also hosted by the BC Libraries Co-op, so our entire collection is hosted on servers that are owned by Canadian public libraries, which is kind of awesome. So usually when people access the public library, they do it through over, or eBooks, they do it through OverDrive, um, or audiobooks, they do it through OverDrive, recorded books, 3M, all these companies, but these, this collection of books for people with print disabilities is DRM free and hosted on Canadian servers owned by Canadian public libraries. Speaking of punk rock. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to give you a sense of some of the books that have been requested through our collection, just so you know like what kind of requests we get. So this is one we got last week um, called Misfit. <coughs> this is Miracle at the Forks about the Museum of Human Rights. Someone requested this. So these are books people have just asked for. An Army of Problem Solvers, Reconciliation in the Solutions Economy, Utopia for Realists, surprise, and The Princess and the Pony. So we get requests from people of all ages and we make them happen. So our ability to, I'll just go back a sec, our ability to um, work in accessible publishing is limited by our, we're a public library body, so we're small and we don't have a ton of cash. Um, but we got a grant from the Employment and Social Development Canada through their social partnerships, or, uh, oh, wow, I've never stumbled before on that. Um, oh, SD. Social Development Partnerships Program Disability Component. So they gave us a chunk of money last year and a chunk of money this year, and it let us do a bunch of things. It let us hire a team of accessibility testers who in the back corner first to learn how to produce, uh, how to produce books the way we do it, and now to test, create reports for Canadian publishers on how accessible their eBooks are. They're also testing those library apps because it turns out that OverDrive isn't accessible. And so if someone wants to borrow books through their library, they need to use an alternate format library like ours. They can't just use the books that are available there. So they're testing that. Uh, we're also doing some work with Daisy and we're uh, doing a bunch of stuff. Anyway, one of the things that we also decided to do was host an accessible publishing summit. The idea originally was to bring 15 people together for a couple of days in Toronto and come up with a list of guidelines. So the idea was who in the, uh, in the publishing workflow, in the publishing chain, supply chain, who does what so that we can sort of take that piece of pile of work and be like, okay, editors, this part is yours. Authors, you do your image descriptions. Okay, publishers, you do this. Outsourcers, outsource companies, forget what you're called, whatever. You can, you do this part. So we wanted, real, we wanted clarity. Uh, that's not what we got. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess we'll, we'll tell you about what, what, we, end, what we ended up with instead. Um, the, 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 at the end, there's breakfast tomorrow from 8 to 9 a.m. in room CR2, and anyone who's interested in this, whether you know a lot about EPUB or nothing at all, you're welcome to come if you're interested in part, uh, volunteering your time for any of these projects. Do you want I can take over here? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was thinking I should maybe predicate a bit as well how Sabina and I, or, or Ebound and Nels, our organization, started working right. together. So I think um, probably a little over a year ago, Nels got in touch with Laura Brady, as you do when you have a question about something to do with ebooks and accessibility in Canada. And she said, 
you know, we've got this funding and we want to purchase um, a bunch of Canadian books to put into our accessible library. Um, can you tell me like an easy way for me to get in touch with a whole bunch of Canadian publishers and get their books? And Laura said, yes, you should talk to eBound Canada. So Laura put us in touch. And so over the past, I guess, year and a half now, we've been working on um, doing outreach to our publisher clients and getting their books to Nels so that the um, variety of Canadian titles that's available to uh, library patrons with perceptual disabilities is broadened. So we've been sort of doing this ongoing, a lot of sending fair and I send a lot of files back and forth. <laughs> it's sort of the, the like baseline hum of the work that we do together. Um, so at the summit, uh, which I was not involved in um, planning, but I did attend, and there are a number of people, maybe just anyone who's in the room who did attend the summit could put up your hand so we could get a sense. So there's a good number of people who are here today who are also at the summit. Uh, it was at a really lovely time of year in Toronto. <laughs> it was a blizzard! <laughs> Surprise! If you January. remember the last week of January, there was a really crazy snowstorm, and we brought a whole bunch of people from places like Los LA. Angeles. <laughs> I'm looking at for Marisa's in the room somewhere. Uh, a bunch of people came from BC and really got to enjoy Toronto in the depths of January. Um, so do you want to talk a bit about who, what your, your, how your invite list expanded. <laughs> sure. Uh, I will say first of all too that one of the great things about that funding is it allowed us to work with really good people. I mentioned Daisy, but another one is Laura Brady, without whom a lot of these things would not be happening and I don't think we'd be as far ahead in our accessible publishing work as we are. She's a fountain of information and help and we're so lucky to get to work with her. <laughs> <laughs> she gets stuff done. So, so we invited publishers, people who work with publishers, editors, EPUB veterans, government representatives, alternate format producers, and public librarians. The full list of individuals is at access. Oh no, or, yeah, individuals is at our website accessiblepublishing.ca, which is separate from our nnels.ca website. Um, so we started off our day with. Um, uh, well, we started off a day with a bunch of stuff, but then when we got into the meat, we. Uh, invited Daniela Levy Pinto to have a to talk about what it was like to read a, to her experience reading books wa, wa, reading while blind and what that what alternate formats and EPUB have meant for her and describe what she and her team have learned looking at the accessibility of Canadian EPUB files. So following that short talk, we'll talk about those in a second. But following that short talk, we had a series of demos from our accessibility testers. And so they were all at a table and people could come and you could look at, see how they read an accessible EPUB file and how they read an, ex an inaccessible one and what a difference that is. So um, they're go uh, they'll be speaking today, but they'll also be in the discussion circles. It's starting at 3, 3.05, I believe. So I encourage you to uh, s visit their tables because it's eye-opening, eye mind-expanding, mind-blowing what they do. So this is Steve Mergaski showing um, read, reading with a, his phone and a refreshable braille display. This is Daniela demonstrating, I think she was demonstrating voiceover. She was demonstrating books. And this is another of our testers, uh, Caden Ferris, demonstrating with, it, with all the Tim Hortons coffee cups on the table um, <laughs> on his iPad. All right. Yeah, and then we came up with a list. Of, well, yeah, then we discussed what accessibility means to us. Yeah, so we sort of um, started the two-day summit talking about what does accessibility mean to all of us. And it was a really interesting group to have together. Um, for me personally, coming from the publishing industry to be in a room with librarians and with people from various government bodies and people who are actual users of um, alternate format texts, uh, you know, I think it's great to talk to people in publishing, and there's so many wonderful people who have brilliant ideas about these things, but it does, you know, you can feel like you're sort of in an echo chamber where it's, we're all sort of saying the same things to each other over and over again, and so it's really wonderful to speak to people from these different industries and hear different perspectives. 
Um, and so we sort of started the day by just brainstorming and saying, what does accessibility really mean to us? And from all these different perspectives, you know, it means op different options for how you read. It also means um, new opportunity for sales for publishers to an underserved audience of readers. Uh, it also means timeliness. So this is something that both users and librarians were speaking to, which is having accessible ebooks available at the same time as print versions is not always something that is available. Uh, making books easier to find and increasing discoverability, um, increasing the inclusivity and equitable nature of access to text. Um, also, realizing that this is, you know, a responsibility and a task that we should all share and we should all be working towards together. Um, and that it affects, there are a lot of intersectional issues that affect how people are able to access text and um, internet connectivity is obviously a big one, making sure that or a lot of these um, devices and reading formats are predicated on, on internet connectivity and how can we make sure that that is available to people in all the disparate parts of this country in order to be able to access these texts that we're making. So already we were sort of beyond the scope of guidelines, right? Like our 10 things we wanted to come out of this summit with like these are the 10 things we're going to do. So then we talked about some of the challenges that we face in creating EPUBs and um, the challenges that we saw when the uh, NELS testers gave us their demos. So things like lack of semantic tags, um, including headings for navigation. Um, I was at uh, Caroline's table, who's here today as well, during the demos, and she showed me an ebook that had no headings, like the entire thing was in P tags. And it was a whole book with not a single heading. And the idea of trying to navigate that or have any idea where you are in the text was really eye-opening for me. Um, lack of page numbers if you're trying to reference print material. Um, Caroline, I believe, has a law degree. Is that correct? Caroline, is that correct? So things like page numbers are really important when you're a lawyer and you're needing to reference text and be able to cite pages. And a lot of ebooks do not have page numbers. Um, broken and incomplete tables of contents are obviously huge barriers to uh, navigation. Images that don't have a useful description in the alt text. So we were talking about this. Um, yesterday, uh, I think Romaine was talking about an alt text that just says cover does not really tell anyone what is in the cover image. Um, the common use of EPUB 2, uh, still pretty ubiquitous in the retail market. Fixed layout is also problematic because you can't resize the text or change the font. Uh, and then just difficulty in searching and discoverability, both when you're looking for a book and then once you're inside a book as well. Uh, so Kate oh, Edwards, wait, the... Wait, can I preface this? Oh, yeah. So the, the next thing we did was uh, we didn't have a lot of speakers or talks, but we did have a few. So we invited a few people to come and talk for maximum seven minutes, I think it was, five to seven minutes, about what, they, what their perspective was on accessible publishing in Canada. So, that's, so the, the next few slides are sort of summar summarizing, touching on some of the things that they said. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Kate Edwards, my colleague uh, at the Association of Canadian Publishers, which for the Americans in the room is the trade organization for independent publishers in this country. Uh, and I talked a bit about how, in some ways, the conversations that we're having now about ex accessibility are reminiscent, reminiscent of the conversations we had in the early days about eBooks. Um, when, and I was not at eBound in those very early days, but, um, Questions like, do we have the staff capacity to do this in-house, and are we going to build the technical expertise here, or should we outsource this? How much is it going to cost? What's the business case for creating books in these new models? Uh, will it be different for books that have a lot of illustrations, or graphs, or tables? Uh, where is this market going? Is this something that we should really be, you know, 100% committed to and investing in a single format or a single path, and what's the growth potential? 
And then from the publisher perspective, what's needed for us to support the independent Canadian publishers that we work with, some of whom have like two staff members, uh, in making these changes. And so this was similar to the conversations that we had in the early days of eBooks and are still having in a lot of ways. Um, so we need to provide professional development and ongoing training on new and emerging standards because uh, these things keep changing all the time. And so attending a workshop three years ago will not hold you in good stead for you know, the next decade. Um, we need to do more research uh, in order to determine demand and figure out you know, what formats should we be using? Should we pri be prioritizing certain types of books? We need to work with our ebook vendor and wholesale partners. So companies like Kobo and Apple and Amazon as much as they're willing to work with us. Uh, and then also with, on the library side, uh, Overdrive and the libraries themselves directly. And uh, we have been thinking about and will continue to work on collective projects and shared resources to reduce the barrier, particularly for the smaller publishers who can't, you know, hire someone to do just this job. Oh, just keep going. <laughs> uh, and then we talked a bit about some of the challenges for publishers. Um, and so one of the things that I hear a lot in conversations with publishers and feel myself is that it feels nebulous at times, like there are all these different guidelines and specifications and formats, and if you don't have time to read the entire EPUB 3 spec, uh, you know, where, where can you go for just a quick guide that will give you sort of the basic rundown if you're not an ebook developer, but you just want to know sort of what the requirements are, where can you find that information? Uh, and then backlist titles are a huge challenge. So it's one thing I think to talk about going forward and implementing um, a born accessible workflow, but if you've got hundreds or thousands of backlist titles, are you also updating those and what does that process look like? Glad I'm not a publisher. Um, <laughs> Rachel Comerford from Macmillan Learning talked about educational publishing. Um, she said that PDFs are still more known and more common than EPUBs. She also said that's partly because teachers know how to email a PDF. They know what to do with that file. People unfamiliar with HTML often think it is scary and or difficult, and plus they also know how to use PDFs. <laughs> so they, they know that publishers can't be trusted, the teachers. So there's still really low uptake of EPUB even when it is accessible. So this was kind of, um, repeated by Adam Wilton and Bob Minry. So Adam's from BC and Bob's from Ontario. They produce alternate format materials for students in the K-12 sector. Well, Bob also for the academic, for post-secondary. So they said that braille rendering issues with EPUB, their braille in rendering issues with EPUB and doc format is just safer. They need page numbers in EPUB before they can start to use it. Math and science is even more problematic, and the skill set demands of staff are a challenge. So imagine staff, instead of learning how to format a Word document, are suddenly have, being asked to learn HTML and CSS to make EPUBs a little bit better when they get those for their students. So early on, before when the summit was just an idea, I spoke with Bob and Adam on the phone, and they said, this is, this is all well and good, but we're starting to produce EPUB. We can only do it for fiction titles but we're really nervous that whatever standards are set will not be good enough for, for, for us as, alternate format, as academic alternate format producers. They said, we need page numbers, we need page numbers. And one of the things we do at NELS, because we, supp we supply public libraries, we don't put page numbers in our books, like most of our, unless they're requested. So usually the, it doesn't follow the page number of the book, just because it takes that much longer. So it saves us a lot of time to just do the basic formatting that we do. And so that's one of the reasons that um, the post-secondary folks get a little bit nervous about the public folks because they're worried that we won't speak for them. So I'm here speaking for them saying page numbers in EPUB reflecting the print book is for them really, really important. Um, Adam also gave the example of a student who has a refreshable braille display who, um, who wants a, a who wants a book, but they, and they have it in EPUB, but then they also end up converting it to doc, I think, so that the student can read it. So that people are just more familiar with Word documents 
and PDF still than anything else. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also had a few representatives from the Department of Canadian Heritage with us, so Julie Fairweather and Michael Cote uh, from the Canada Book Fund. Um, and they had done some research of their own ahead of, well, un unrelated to the summit, but they had done some research of their own uh, on sort of where publishers are with accessible texts and um, had provided us with the results of their surveys. And so they sort of came to the summit saying that they know that there's work to be done before publishers will be ready to create born accessible texts. Um, and that there are still a lot of issues with distribution, uh, discoverability, and metadata. Uh, Julie made a note that um, the, I think it's the Bibliothèque Nationale of Quebec, has uh, implemented a collective solution towards creating ebooks um, that the rest of Canada and other uh, organizations could be looking at as well. Um, there are still issues with distribution and ebook pricing, and of course, copyright as well. Uh, and Julie and Michael's, or Michelle, sorry, uh, their sort of final message would, was how great it would be if everyone in Canada had access to Canadian authored books. Oh, Marisa from the DAISY Consortium. So she talked about DAISY's works. So uh, two asides, one is these slides are more text heavy than anything we usually do, but we understand that the slides are available afterwards. So if any of this is useful for you in your work, please go ahead and steal, steal anything um, with credit to the folks who said things. Um, but we're, uh, Marisa's gave a list of um, resources, but we'll get to the resource slides in a second and hopefully sort of skim them so your eyes don't go crossy. crossy. So Marisa's conclusion was how great would it be to demystify accessibility in publishing and make it something concrete that we should do from the, from the beginning. So the idea that accessibility itself should be accessible. All right. I don't know. Yeah, you okay. like this one. So Sarah Hilderly from Exclusive Publishing <coughs> was also there. We asked her to talk about who else is doing stuff internationally. So this is a short list. It's not complete, and it includes some things that uh, Sarah didn't mention, um, but which are also timely and probably leaves off a bunch of things that she did mention because, because of notes. Um, so Australia, there are publishers there meeting regularly sort of across, across sectoral groups, sort of like what we had, so that's neat. Um, in the UK, there are a few things going on, the Aspire Project, Publishers Association, Accessibility Action Group. So these are all projects related to publishers and accessibility and these little links in the slides. In, it in Italy, the publishers set up Fondazione Lia, to, uh, they take the books from publishers, they make them accessible, they send them go a little back and forth, and then they actually, I think, also distribute the books themselves. So it's a publisher organization rather than whatever weird is starting to happen here in Canada. Um, in Kenya, there's a group called Ekitabu that works with schools. They just won the Accessible Book Consortium at WIPO's International um, uh, Award, f I forget what the name of the award is, but it's an award for um, accessible publishing. And so they, they have a neat uh, toolkit of books that are in EPUB format and, uh, like, sorry, uh, how, how, to do, how to do things in sort of a very clear way with nice screenshots and test books and stuff. So they have a neat, cool, neat toolkit on their website. As someone who's not an ebook developer, I'm not sure if it's like amazing. It looks amazing <laughs> to me. And then, of course, Benetech. Um, has a ton of resources, so we'll get to those in a moment. So there are a lot, but the point is that there are lots of people who are doing things. Um, a, a, a group of us was at the London Book Fair last week where these awards were being presented because we were, we were shortlisted for those ones that Ekitabu won, which was amazing. But the neatest part of that was getting to meet people and talk to them. And the thing that we learned is that there's no one solution in a country for how to make books accessible. So everyone's sort of figuring it out and everyone's doing it a little bit differently, but it's a, it's a really friendly crowd, which is awesome. So there's no one saying this is, this is our model and it's trademarked and you can't use it. So everyone's open to like figuring this out. How do we work together to make books more accessible? So now we're going to go into the crazy list. So these are things that we learned through the summit as tools. So these will these slide these these are the slides. So the BISG um, has a quick start guide to accessible publishing, and it's currently being updated. So this is the link to the public draft 
of the latest document. And then, oh, I think this was your slide. I'm okay. sorry. No, okay. <laughs> then there are the W3C business working community groups, and I think in our speaker's notes we have a list of what some of those mm -hmm. are. And we'll post um, the slides from this presentation in the SCED app. Uh, so that you can access them after. And I, you hyperlinked all these things in there, yeah. right? Yeah, so you can get all these links from our presentation after. And if they're the wrong links, please let us know so that we can fix them for other people because we don't know if they're the right things. Um, and I'll also link it in my um, SCED bio so that because it's just a Google Slides link, right? Yeah. Okay, and then the Accessible Book Consortium has a charter for accessible publishing. So if any of you were in the DAISY session yesterday morning, one of the most important things to have at the start is buy-in from the organization. So this is where Accessible Book Consortium Charter for Accessible Publishing comes in. It's saying, yes, we are committed to accessible publishing. And then, of course, there's the e-production uh, hashtag on the Twitters, and uh, people recommended, actually, Sarah recommended Laura Brady's excellent lynda.com training videos for making accessible EPUB. Mm -hmm. And if you live in Toronto, lynda.com is accessible through the Toronto Public Library. That's still true, Maria? Okay, okay great. <laughs> and if like, you live in rural Alberta, it's not. Oh, but check your, if you don't live in Toronto, check your library and you may also have access to lynda.com, um, which is an amazing resource to be able to access through your library. Okay, ready? Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, I can it. do this one, yeah. So, um, this is another sort of rundown of resources that are available to you. So the Accessible Publishing Knowledge Base is a really great like first place to go. Um, it really does have all the info. Um, the DAISY Pipeline uh, walks you through converting to alternate formats. The ACE Accessibility Tester is a great tool that you can use. It's super easy. You can drag and drop your EPUBs onto it and it will give you much like the EPUB validator if you are familiar with EPUB check. Um, it will give you a uh, full report card on your ebook and what you are missing in order to create or to have all the functionality that makes an ebook truly accessible. Um, SMART is a, an add on, is that an accurate description, to um, ACE that will sort of walk you through the findings uh, that you see in the ACE uh, checker. Uh, EPUB check, already, as we've already mentioned today, you can support EPUB check by getting the t-shirt. Uh, you can speak to Svia or Rachel if you want one of those cool t-shirts. Um, and then of course the uh, epubtest.org, so it's, which is uh, testing, which tests reading platforms using a EPUB file. Yeah. And ACE is free and open source, and I think the graphical user interface is coming soon. And then the Smart is a paid app, uh, free for s a smaller use, I believe. Is that right? Okay. Two, <laughs> two books a month? Okay. And then we have the Benetech resource suite. So they created, so um, Shannon mentioned that the knowledge base is a good first place to go. I think it's actually a good second or third place to go terrifies me. <laughs> Bear is not afraid of it. Um, but the top tips for creating accessible EPUB 3 files is a, is a, is a it's text on a page, and uh, that's a, a, and also good, a good first step. The Diagram Center gives you image description guidelines. The Global Certified Accessible is an accessibility certification pro project. And then they do stuff like MathML Cloud for accessible math. So these are, again, part of things that came up at the summit. There, there's more that Benetech does, so you can look on their website. Um, and in case the words are getting mixed up, so Bookshare, some of you may have heard of, is part of Benetech. All right. Uh. <laughs> Um, yeah, so when I was um, talking earlier about, you know, going to the summit and wanting to have sort of a checklist that we could give publishers of how to make their ebooks accessible, uh, we realized that's not entirely possible, but that there are a lot of different resources and standards and specifications that you can look to. Um, so yesterday, Romain referred to the WCAG Content Accessibility Guidelines as the Holy Scriptures, so definitely start there. Uh, they also have the Techniques Guide for Implementing the Standards. 
Um, EPUB 3, of course, as Dave talked about earlier today, and then there's the EPUB Accessibility Specification 1.0. Uh, the ACT, Accessibility Conformance Testing Rules, there's the Accessible Metadata Project, and the EPUB ARIA Rule Authoring Guide as well. Are any of you new to EPUB? Or are all of you like, oh yeah, I get this stuff. Okay, right? Doesn't that make you go like, <gasps> right? Yeah, okay. Uh, Dave Kramer will tell you it, it, you don't need to do that. Right, Dave? Right. Yeah. You don't need to read all of these things before you start playing in an EPUB file, right? No. Right. Okay. <laughs> so where does like so that's like that, that's our list as far as we know. But where to start? Uh, we recommend taking a tour from some good guides like uh, Marisa and Romain from Del Tour and check out their slides from yesterday morning session. So there's a link there to their slides because those are excellent. They have they have all of those tools, but sort of broken down with more detail and a lot more uh, emojis and funny things. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so one of the things we talked about at the summit was um, EPUB 2 versus EPUB 3. And I attended another workshop that Nels organized a few weeks ago uh, with Lisa Snyder from Access, Access Changes Everything. And um, it was interesting to sort of hear her perspective on things because she is not a publishing person. She's got a library background and an engineering background and sort of has been publishing adjacent, but has never really worked in publishing. And so during the workshop, she was sort of like, why, why are people still making EPUB 2? Like from an objective perspective, this makes no sense. Like EPUB 3 is so much better. And um, I, there's a lot of reasons that people are still making EPUB 2 instead of EPUB 3, um, and some of them are very valid, and I think some of them are just that people are afraid or they've heard rumors that some vendors won't take them. Um, so BookNet Canada had put out a survey, I think this is from the digital report last year, that said 50% of Canadian publishers uh, are, st are producing EPUB 3 at this point. Um, there's high awareness of the format but low implementation. And one uh, ebook vendor that was at the summit said that they're still seeing about 60% of the new material that's coming in is in EPUB 2 format. Um, so one thing that I know I hear sometimes when talking to publishers is that they think it's going to be expensive to um, change their workflows from EPUB 2 to EPUB 3. In theory, that shouldn't Sorry, be the case. Uh, if you're using InDesign, it's really just a toggle from EPUB 2 to EPUB 3. Um, there are, for lots of organizations, there are sort of practical workflow issues that need to be overcome. Um, but our hope is that we will, cons we will convince more publishers to move towards EPUB 3. Yes. Okay. Your reasons. <laughs> Uh, so why is EPUB 2 still around? Um, so the sense that I have sort of got from talking to publishers is that there, for a long time there were still vendors who wouldn't take EPUB 3, which meant that publishers would say, well, I'm not going to create an EPUB 3 file for these five vendors and then create an EPUB 2 for these two vendors that are still holding out. So people just ended up catering to the lowest common denominator and creating EPUB 2, which everybody will take. Um, we also heard at the summit that one company was actively discouraging EPUB 3 because it didn't work uh, well with their proprietary tooling. So there are these sort of issues in the market that are dissuading publishers from making those changes. Yeah, so even after that proprietary tooling does accept EPUB 3, the impression is still out there that it doesn't. So these are from, th these are some charts from the Department of Canadian Heritage uh, uh, survey. So this is, this is a small sample of Canadian publishers and they were all English speaking. So the questions that they asked were, what are the biggest barriers to republishing business and making titles more accessible? So 56 responses only. Uh, accessibility is a low priority, 4%. Digital rights management concerns are 7%. Don't know enough about the subject or technologies involved, 27%. Access to technology is 39. Projected revenue is low, 54. And now we're getting into the meat. Staff availability is an issue, 64%. Costs are high, 68%. So the next question was, in order to create titles that are more accessible, which of the following would be beneficial? So um, 
first was access to a third party service with 47%, so someone, someone else to do the accessibility stuff for us. Second was training and technological capacity to do this in-house, so that was impressive that it's, it is at 25%. And the third one was other, please explain. Um, and there were a few who said things other than this, but most people said funding, just plain old money. <laughs> So that kind of, going back to the previous slide, costs are high, but there are a whole bunch of other barriers that may not necessarily be addressed by just money itself. So, we're, yeah, we're also lucky to live in Canada where there is a lot of federal support for, for publishing. Like, it's a, it's a rich environment in which to work. Like, I'm not saying we're getting rich off of publishing, but it's, there, there are a lot of people who do work in publishing thanks to that support and have for a long time. So they also asked, how do you create accessible formats of your titles? They only got 40 responses. And this isn't quite, um, I, I, I'm not sure if they were asking the right question. So they were, I think they wanted to know who creates your EPUB, EPUBs for you. But I think people were interpreting this as, or maybe they weren't, but interpreting as who creates the further formats, like the DAISY and the MP3 or whatever formats. So in-house, 48% third-party producer. So we know from this that there are a significant number of Canadi uh, Canadian publishers, of course, who outsource their work. So we sort of have two groups of publishers, those who do work their work in-house and those who outsource. So there's a little bit of a distinction where we can work in separate groups, or not separate groups, but we can create maybe some things that we can give to those outsourcing companies is like, these are the things that we need you to do. And so another thing that we have in libraries is we can ask these same things of the apps that we're using. These are the accessibility features we need you to have in your, e in your ebook and audiobook apps. So looking at that kind of approach of, of making these um, requirements for procurement. So, one of the goals coming out of the summit um, and that Nels and Ebound share in our work uh, going forward is that we want to encourage publishers to move towards born accessible publishing, which means including the accessibility features in the ebook from the beginning as you're developing it. Um, and one of the main reasons, uh, I think, from the publisher perspective to move towards that is that it's a lot easier to add in those features at from the outset than to go back and rip your book apart and add them retroactively. Um, another uh, point to take away that we've talked about um, at the summit and I talked about uh, at the Nels workshop that I attended a few weeks ago with Lisa Snyder was that accessibility features are good for everyone. Um, not only do they help people with perceptual disabilities to read books in different formats, but they also improve the discoverability and, C and SEO for in general for your books because detailed metadata, things like video transcripts and video captions and alt text um, can all serve to improve search engine and distribution engine findings. So this isn't, you know, a body of work that's only going to serve one small population. It's really going to help your books be found across all different engines and platforms. Oops. So, so how are we going to do that? So we went from this idea of 15 people in a working group um, to having eight working groups. So <laughs> uh, the first one, we'll go through them. Look, we have slides for all of them. Um, but we'll go through them quickly. These are the groups to which you are invited. Uh, a website meta project. So this is like the website to end all web. Well, maybe I'll just skip straight through. So uh, this is the website to end all websites. So we have uh, creating a clearinghouse of accessible resources for publishers, authors, and content creators. Cut and post code examples. Collect and review documents. Create the checklists. So these were all the missing pieces. That, so what we found was that we have all of these guidelines. We have all of the information. And we have these people who know all of this stuff, these really smart people who know everything there is to know right now about EPUB accessibility. But then we have the publishers and librarians on the ground who are like, uh, EPUB 3 accessibility, what keg, what are all of these things? So this is a website that's going to build that bridge and tell us what th the other thing that came up at the summit was we were looking at documents that it turned out were oh people were like oh those are like that's not useful anymore well, how, like how do we know why is it still on the internet if it's not useful <laughs> so this is that's a bigger question i think <laughs> yeah. and i think wendy reed are you leading this project 
Wendy Reed is leading this project. So if you want to work with Wendy Reed and a bunch of good people, have at her. Okay. Uh, the second working group that came out of the summit is uh, investigating the idea of a certification meta project. So looking into the possibility of creating a Canadian certification body for EPUB. Um, so looking at something like uh, gold, silver, and bronze levels of accessibility in EPUB files and um, sort of a, a process that publishers could put their books through to say like, yes, this is a certified accessible book. Um, and there's uh, Benetech um, and Charles Lapierre is in the room somewhere. Uh, has already, they've done this work in the US and so that's something that we definitely do not need to reinvent the wheel and would not do it as well as Benetech had uh, in Canada if we did it on our own. So we will be looking to the work that Benetech has done and seeing if there's a way to sort of um, use that to create a Canadian solution as well. And it sounds like other countries, like LIA in Italy, have also created a certification pro program. So the, 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 the way this came out, this actually came out of a few different groups that were brainstorming questions, but one of those groups was the communication group. Like, how do we communicate to publishers all of this information, not all of this information, but the useful information? So the idea, the idea sort of came about, well, a certification program where it's really clear what the steps are to proceed, through which to proceed, that that might make sense. So, uh, we're not committed to a certification pro project necessarily. It's more of like a: is this the is this the way to is this the way to solve our problems? Like, it, or do, will this does this work? And Laura Brady is leading this bad boy, bad girl, <laughs> bad one. Okay, so the third one was a grow the network. So just the idea of like build, build, building the relationships to do more. So who is doing good work that we can support in Canada and internationally? How can we share information about accessible publishing and with whom? So part of this is conferences, blogs, what have you. And then also how can English and French Canada learn from each other and work together? So we learned that there's English and French, French publishing are sort of two different worlds. And how can we learn from and support the work of other teams? So collaborating with other groups internationally, if the more we can do that, the, the better it is for the world. Um, another thing that we talked about at the summit was um, involving people who have perceptual disabilities more in the publishing process instead of just bringing them in right at the end. Uh, so looking at uh, people with print disabilities conducting accessibility testing and also advising on workflows. So testers can review ebooks and reading applications. Um, I think the testing that we've done or that Nels has done so far has mostly been testers receiving finished ebooks. Um, and we're now, Nels and Ebound are working on a proposal for a project um, to Department of Canadian Heritage, which we don't have funding for yet, but everybody keep their fingers crossed, uh, to try to involve testers earlier in the process. So when you are setting out to make your ebook, speak to a tester then before it's already done, and then they give you all your advice and you have to rip your book apart. So looking at bringing testers into all stages of book development, development to enhance accessibility. They can give you feedback really, really quickly. They can tell you what works and what doesn't in a matter of minutes. Oh, and then the accessible publishing government policy. So the goal of this group uh, was to work with government bodies to strategize about early programs of incentives. What are the funding and policy tools available to advance accessible publishing in Canada? So. The thing that came up at the summit was this idea of carrots and sticks. So I learned that government people talk about carrots and sticks. Like they use those words instead of incentive and disincentive. They actually use carrots and sticks. So <laughs> it's funny because I didn't think they were that casual about their carrots and sticks. Um, but this group would also talk about things like connectivity, social inclusion, and access to technology, which were sort of recurring themes. And internet connectivity in Canada is a real issue, as are social inclusion and access to tech. So an example of an issue with access to technology, uh, there, if someone has a refreshable braille display and they're blind, they can access the world. But if they don't have that refreshable braille display, which is an expensive several thousand dollar device, they don't have access to the world. So how to make sure that people who need the technology 
to be full participants in society have access to that stuff. And every province has sort of its own thing. In Ontario, you have, um, you, in Ontario, there's a program for people to access technology that's somewhat funded. In Alberta, so far as I know, there's actually nothing. So there are big differences in what is and isn't available. Oh, we're running out of time. All right. Uh, so the sixth working group is around public training and social inclusion, so encouraging universal design of both the contents and the tools that we use to read those contents. Um, and the issue that most people who are currently served by alternate format libraries are seniors who do not and may never know how to use an EPUB file. So how do we bridge that gap, which will continue to grow as the boomers age, and improve access to books and reading for everyone? And make it cheap, well not like so that publishers lose money, but so that <laughs> everyone, so that the cost isn't a barrier to people reading. Ooh, licensing and rights. Um, how to ensure content creators are paid for the work and that readers have access to cultural production, so both sides of that coin. What are the models and libraries that work well? And this is an opportunity to explore alternatives to digital rights management, such as streaming. So that was a specific thing that came up from that group. And then, I think we're almost at the end here, search and discoverability, uh, so metadata, one of my favorite topics. Uh, there are metadata standards for accessible content. How can we increase the use of these standards by publishers, and how can we expose this information to end users so that books are discoverable, are discoverable based on their accessibility? Um, and the idea that electronic reading platforms should be accessible from end to end. Uh, one interesting thing that I learned from speaking to someone in the library community recently was that um, accessibility metadata is really important to librarians. Uh, they will look for that info so that they can point library users towards um, either text that will serve their needs or also things like if there's an accessibility hazard, um, those schema.org tags are really important for saying if you have a seizure disorder, this book has a bunch of flashing lights and it's not gonna be a good fit for you. <laughs> All right, so bit.ly bit slash nels dot survey dash survey gives us to that where you can sign up for any of those groups. And I meant to make a clean version, but it includes the people who signed up initially, who may or may not sign up again, and doesn't include all the people who've signed up since. So um, it a, has a Canadian focus, but everyone is welcome. And uh, there's also a link here to our 30-something page report from the summit if anyone is interested in reading such a thing. And we just thought we'd close with a few quotes. I know we've thrown a lot of information and calls for action out at you, and we just sort of wanted to bring it back to the reason that we're all here talking about this and thinking about these things. So this is a quote from Toni Morrison. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. This is how civilizations heal. I know the world is bruised and bleeding, and though it is important not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. Like failure, chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge, even wisdom, like art. Love that. Uh, Jeanette Winterson. I do not believe that art, all art, and beauty are ever separate, nor do I believe that either art or beauty are optional in a, in a sane society. That puts me on the side of what Harold Bloom calls the ecstasy of the privileged moment. Art, all art, as insight, as rapture, as transformation, as joy. Unlike Harold Bloom, I really believe that human beings can be taught to love what they do not love already, and that the privileged moment exists for all of us if we let it. Letting art is the paradox of active surrender. I have to work for art if I want art to work for me. We're all here because people write books. And I think we owe it to those authors as much as we owe it to our readers to make them accessible to everyone. Thank you.